principles. I've done it this way. Okay? The point I'm trying to argue is that actually my x and y have a very special property. Namely, I claim that the law of x plus y, which of course, what is it? It's, I have to do like alpha inverse L1 plus alpha inverse L2 plus uh, R mu1 of L1 star plus R mu2 of L2 star. This is what they are, right? I've just copied verbatim what the definitions are. I claim that actually it has the same law as just alpha inverse L1 plus L2 star. And I have to divide by, what do I do? Divide by square root of 2, I think. Sorry. I'm, oh, here we are. I'm missing. Yeah, it's on the next page. Yeah, right, square root of 2. Here, oh, I divided by 2 here, yeah, sorry. By 2 here, and then here what I will do is r mu, oh, I, I was missing alpha, sorry, of um, alpha L1 plus L2 star. Okay, so why is that? Well, again, if you think about how you would compute the uh, any power series in, in x plus y and apply it to E0 and dot it with E0, the essential thing is that uh, you have to use the fact that L1 star cancels L1, that that's 0. You have to use the fact that L1 kills E0. And once you know these two things, basically that's sufficient to understand how to compute any power series in in L and in, in L1 applied to E0. Okay? And what I'm claiming here is that uh, these two things have essentially the same relations. Actually, more precisely, what happens is that yes. Sorry, one. What? Oh, sh there should be a. Oh, sh there should be no stars, right? Sorry, I was. Yeah. Okay. To what? Well, it's alpha multiplying the two of them together. Uh, yeah, but, but there are two of them here, so the point is that if I look at, the whole point is that if I look at L1 plus L2, uh, L2 star multiplying by L1 plus L2, then what you get is something like L1 star L1 plus L1 star L2 plus L2 star L1 plus L2 star L2, and now these are zero. Right, because one of them creates a vector and the other immediately tries to annihilate a vector, but with a perpendicular vector. And so this is two, that's my point. I mean, if, would, would this make you happier? Okay, but it, it's the same, same thing. I haven't changed the law. Okay, and so the point here is, so why, why this has the same law as that? Well, more or less, um, uh, this, is, this is a universal statement about all, all possible functions R, so you can just check it for like uh, monomials. So check this, check when R of z is something z to the n or something like that. And you will see that actually um, here, uh, uh, the, the, just because you have this, this relation here, um, you... you um, you on the nose get the same expression when you evaluate such a thing on E0 uh, and, and then dot with E0. It will be the same thing as evaluating 
that on E0 dot E0. So if I take any function of this operator and any function of this operator, you, you can check very easily just by these kinds of combinatorial identities, then the answer will be always the same. Okay. And so what that tells you is that uh, the, the uh, x plus y, which is the guy whose R transform is mu, is associated with the convolution of the two measures, has this R transform simply the sum of the two R transforms. All right. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on just the combinatorics of it, but um, I just want to mention um, a very pretty formula which tells you how to connect things together. You see, if you uh, are again in this compactly supported situation, uh, if you look at g mu of z, which is the integral of, uh, what is it, g mu of t over z minus t, uh, well, the correct thing to do is to factor out a z, so you get here 1 over t over z, and this you can now expand as a power series in uh, t over z, right, for z sufficiently large, so this is nothing but 1 over z, uh, the integral of a sum of t over z to the m d mu of t. Uh, I should call it k. And uh, if you uh, write mk, if, if mn is the nth moment of your probability measures is written there, then what you get is some uh, mk z to the minus k plus 1, right? So this is what this thing g mu z is, written as a power series in 1 over z. Up to a shift, it's the moments, the moment generating function of your measure. Now, um, the R transform can also be expanded. I told you in this case it's a, an analytic function, so it's some sum, say, a m uh, z to the, what I want, n, m minus 1. And it turns out there's a very pretty, f uh, a uh, formula, combinatorial formula that, that links the numbers mn and the numbers alpha n. Uh, so the only thing that should be explained there is what is nc of n and what does it mean to be a, blo a block. So nc of n here is the set of all non-crossing partitions. So nc of n, um, well, you have numbers between 1 and n. Uh, you order them. And then you look at all possible partitions, which means just as you write the set as a disjoint union of subsets. But these partitions are supposed to be non-crossing. So if you indicate which elements are in a given subset, so here, 3, 4, 5, 6, n equals 6, I'm looking at a partition which has 1, 3, and 4 in one part of the partition, two separately, five and six in the other part of the partition. This is non-crossing because I can draw it in a non-crossing way. Um, something that would be crossing is if I did this, for instance. If I decided that I have partition with classes one, three, four, and then two, five, six, that would be crossing, as you obviously see. So that's not permitted. And now you are taking the summation over all non-crossing partitions, then you take the product over the classes of the partition, the blocks of the partition. So in this case, there would be three blocks. The block 1, 3, 4, the block 2, and the block 5, 6. And then you take the product of the cumulants associated to these, these numbers, uh, alpha m are called cum free cumulants, um, of the numbers alpha m associated to the sizes of the blocks. So the term in that uh, sum corresponding to this particular partition would be what? Alpha sub, the size of the block is 3, times alpha sub 1, times alpha sub 2, right? Yeah? From the sizes of these three blocks that we have here. And so it says that you can recover the, the, the moments by just summing these numbers alpha. In fact, you can go the opposite way. You can recover the numbers back, and it's, a, it's actually a very useful combinatorial thing. Incidentally, the big interesting thing here is that the passage from classical to free probability is just the replacement of the space of all partitions 
crossing or not by the space of non-crossing partitions. A uh, very similar formula will hold for the logarithm of the Fourier transform coefficients of it if you um, drop non-crossing. Okay? Yeah, the alphas are called free cumulants. They're numbers indexed by integers, and they're the coefficients of the power series expansion of this R transform. Okay. So in particular, they add, they're additive for free convolution because the whole power series is additive for free convolution. All right, the free central limit theorem. So the free central limit theorem is an analog of the classical one, and it says that if you do a central limit sum, uh, x1 up to xn, rescale it appropriately, and put some conditions, so the conditions are that these xj's are independent, um, I, let's assume that they are identically distributed, or I don't think I even, I'm assuming that. The key thing is some growth conditions on moments, which I did not state here. And then the, the point here, yeah, I think I should have, the way it's stated it should be called IID, but anyways. Um, uh, there's some condition on the moments, on the second moment, and some condition on them being centered. Then the statement is that the law of the central limit sum will converge to the semicircle law. And um, the way to prove it, one way to do it is very, very simple. I forget if I put the proof, yeah, I didn't put the proof there. Uh, it's just the, let's look at this cumulant uh, situation. So what you prove is that if you dilate your measure by t, uh, then your R transform, so the R transform of the dilation of a measure by t, so by that I mean just apply the transformation x goes to tx, yeah? So stretch the measure by t. This is something like the R transform of t z uh, one over t, I believe. Um, and so what happens is that uh, when you're computing the R transform of such a device, well, all you're doing is you're adding a bunch of R transforms, and then you're rescaling them by one over square root of n. And if you carefully pay attention to these R transforms and expand them as, as, as um, analytic functions, you will see that uh, your R, let's say, Xi of Z, well, it, it has to start with zero because uh, the first moment is zero. And so the important thing is, uh, is this number A, uh, A squared, it will be times Z plus higher order terms. And so when you're adding them up, uh, so let's say you're summing things from 1 to n, uh, you will get an n in front of here and, and, and an, well, an n in front of there, if you like. <laughs> but then you will be, uh, you'll be rescaling by 1 over square root of n, which conspires to divide this by n and divide this by n, uh, well, let's just put it this way, by, well, divide by more than n, <laughs> by higher power than n, okay? And so all these guys are going to go out in the wash, and here you'll just be left with a squared z. So your R transform is just going to be linear, and that's exactly what happens for the semicircle law. All right. Now, properties of free convolution. Uh, there are some things that are known. One thing is that uh, free convolution is very, very careful, is, is trying its best, if you like, to avoid atoms. So if you take a convolution of two measures, mu and nu, the only way you will have an atom at some point t is if you already had two huge atoms. You must have that one of the measures had a mat uh, an atom at A, another an atom at B, so that A plus B add up to T, and the total mass of these atoms is more than one. Okay? This is sort of related with the fact that if you take two projections on a Hilbert space, um, finite dimensional Hilbert space, and renormalize everything so that the rank of the projection is between zero and one. So you, you normalize things so that the rank of the identity is 1, and the rank of the smallest projection is 1 over n, okay? Then if I take two projections, um, 
they are forced to intersect provided that their ranks together exceed one. Right? If I have two projections, P and Q, P will intersect Q. This will be non-zero. In fact, the rank of it will be bigger or equal than the rank of P plus the rank of Q minus 1. That's just how the geometry of the Hilbert space is. I mean, you know, you just can't, can't avoid it. Um, again, this is normalized rank, right? So that the rank of identity is 1. Um, so, so sometimes, you know, things have to intersect. And when you put things freely, this is more or less what happens. I mean, things only intersect when they have to. And so this is why the only way that you get a spectral projection uh, for such a thing is when you already have substantial spectral projections, so substantial eigenvector, eigenvalues for both operators. Another very interesting fact is something about infinite divisibility, and that there's a whole big story which I will only very lightly touch. So, if you have a, a measure, you can of course define its integer convolution power. Um, this is simply uh, the nth convolution of mu with itself. Um, or if you like, you can define the R transform of this nth convolution power to be n times the R transform of mu, right? Because the R transform linearizes free convolution. Um, well, this definition can be perfectly used to define any convolution power. So you can try to define uh, the teeth convolution power of mu uh, to be such that its R transform is T times the R transform of mu. The issue, of course, is that when you go from R transforms to Cauchy transforms, there's no guarantee a priori that you're actually going to get the Cauchy transform of a measure. You can just get something that isn't. And this is, this is what happens. So amazingly enough, uh, if t is bigger or equal than 1, whether integer or not, this always works. This always gives a measure mu box plus t. But there are some instances where below 1, you don't get a measure. Classically, the situation is somewhat different. If you take a, a measure, there may be no convolution powers except for the integer ones. Think of a pair of two, two um, delta masses. Okay. Um, whereas here, always beyond, beyond one, you can do this. Um, and then there's some regularization effects. Uh, for instance, if, if both measures have density, then the free convolution also has a density. And in fact, if both densities are, say, in LP, then the new density is also in LP. So, so there is some, some regularization properties of it, and so forth. One of the tools for, de for proving these kinds of things is the so-called subordination theorem. And we will prove it in the last lecture if we have time. Um, what it states is that when you do a free convolution, so I'm looking at the free convolution of mu x1 with mu x2, so if you like the law of x1 plus x2, the uh, Cauchy transform of that measure at z is actually the Cauchy transform of either of these measures. You can take either mu x1 or mu x2 as you please, but evaluate it at a different point. And this different point, this function omega that tells you at which point to evaluate, it's called a subordination function. Subordination in, in the sense of complex variables. Um, and um, so, so, so this actually is, is exactly the tool you need, for instance, to prove this last thing here. And it's done in the notes. So it actually gives you a fair amount of analytic information about what happens. In these, yes? I'm sorry? Here? Well, it's equivalent, right? Because I'm either saying that this is, I'm, I'm taking x1, x2 free. So this is, if you like, mu x1 box plus mu x2 but I'm just writing it as the law of a concrete variable x1 plus x2. Is, is that, was that the question? Or? Yeah. Sorry, I was oscillating back and forth between the two notations, but yeah. Okay, and we will see uh, in a little bit how to do this, how, how to prove this subordination result. Um, 
there are more things that can be done. Um, maybe I should mention two. One is that there is also a corresponding theory of box times, multiplicative free convolution. So uh, a separate theory is needed in the, in the non-commutative case because we don't have exponentials. The exponential function works very well in the classical case, e to the x plus y is e to the x, e to the y, so log of x plus y, uh, x times y, sorry, is log x times plus log y. So if you have classical variables, let's say they're positive and you want to multiply them, that's not a big deal. You just take logs of them and then you add the logs, right? They will be again independent. Now, in the free case, these formulas are out the window because x and y don't commute. So you need a separate theory. Nonetheless, a separate theory exists, and, and it has some flavors uh, to say that actually the exponential function, if it were to exist, weren't so bad. Um, I will not describe it in detail, but I'll just define it. If x and y are non-negative, then you define, uh, so it, uh, I mean, sorry, say it a different way. If mu, nu are supported, uh, probability measures supported on R plus, then you define their multiplicative convolution as the law of x, well, let me do this, x one half y x one half, where x has law mu and y has law nu. And this actually is the same as the law of y one half x y one half because of traciality. You can, if you take, for instance, a moment of such a thing, you can put one of these x halves on the other side and then take one of the y halves and put it on the other side to convert between the two expressions. So even though it's defined in this asymmetric way, um, uh, you, it, it's, it's a symmetric operation. Um, this is, of course, a positive operator because I've multiplied a positive operator on both sides by another, by the same positive operator. So it gives you, again, a probability measure on R+. plus. Um, it's also defined for unitaries. Uh, if I take, similarly, mu, nu, probability measures on the unit circle, then I can define mu box plus nu to be the mu of uv, where u is a unitary distributed according to mu, and v um, is a unitary distributed according to nu. So there's also an analytic thing to do to compute that. But now you could say, what other things you can do? Well, you can, in principle, do a much more general operation. You can apply any non-commutative polynomial. And as a matter of fact, there are certain things which are known in this generality. What happens if you take a completely general non-commutative polynomial and apply it to free variables x1, xn? So for example, one thing that uh, is true is that if each of these variables has an algebraic Cauchy transform, so if that Cauchy transform solves an algebraic equation, then um, a polynomial of, of these variables will also have a Cauchy transform that's algebraic. Um, if each one of these mu x i's is non-atomic and p is not the constant polynomial, then a general polynomial uh, will be non-atomic. Okay, so in particular, if you take n random matrices, n GUE matrices, to make a self-adjoint polynomial of them, this will always have a diffuse spectral measure. I would love to have, by the way, a random matrix proof of this. Uh, and then, um, also, there's some story about connected components. If each of the variables, um, well, let me just, since we're running out of time, let me just say that if each law of xi has connected support, then the law of z has to have connected support. And this is a very nice statement. Uh, it follows from the fact that if you take ai, abelian C-star algebras with no projections, no non-trivial projections, then their free product has no non-trivial projections. So projection is simply an element F which is self-adjoint and is idempotent. And this is a result in something called key theory, topological key theory, 
for C star algebras. Uh, and I don't know of another way of proving this, again, besides, besides appealing to those kinds of high power results. Um, so somehow it says that this free product keeps topological spaces connected, whatever that means. All right, one last thing that I just wanted to say. Everything that I've done so far here, uh, except for the previous slide, was about one variable, right? How to compute convolutions of measures. Now, what happens if you have several variables? Well, there the difficulty is that um, the object mu disappears. We no longer can attach a single measure, or in fact, any number of measures, that would encode the joint law of n variables. For a single self-adjoint, you can do this, but for several non-commuting self-adjoints, you can't, because you don't have a spectral theorem of any kind. Nonetheless, g mu still has a very good existence. And this probably will, will be a little bit in Roland's talk. Um, the very good trick here is to look at what are called matricial uh, resolvents. So you start with some variable x, uh, sorry, some n-tuple x1, xn, and you invent a diagonal matrix uh, with entries x1, xn. Okay, so you look at a diagonal matrix like that, x1, xn, Okay, now if you just look at the resolvent of that as a, as a single operator, nothing beautiful happens. But what you do is you look at what happens when you uh, look at, at a resolvent of this sort, where B is a scalar n by n matrix. If you, if you, if you apply uh, my, my trace entry-wise, this, uh, the result of taking this resolvent will be, again, an n by n matrix, a scalar n by n matrix. And so you're get, get, getting a, a kind of a Cauchy transform, but a Cauchy transform that's valued on matrices. So what, what was z before, a complex variable, now becomes a matrix. And um, there's a fair amount that can be done using this, but it's very much kind of a developing theory uh, and that more and more there are parallels emerging between that and the kind of complex analysis that's happening for a single variable z. So unfortunately, uh, that theory is not mature enough to prove statements of this kind yet, but there's room to hope. And uh, that is one of the ways to try to repackage the n variable situation to make it as close as possible to the one variable one. Okay, so I think I, I should quit. Uh, just slightly out of time, so we might defer questions. Uh, we have a little break. I think we have a quarter hour break uh, right now. Okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs>